Okay. This is our main meeting. This meeting is being recorded, so if you don't want to be on the video, just turn your camera off. So good morning, everyone. We're finally getting some warmer weather, which is definitely nice. And uh, before we get started here, I just want to show you guys, I know I sent out an email here. And if you can, all right, good. All right, get in here. Okay, so everyone should be able to see my screen here in a second. This is an email that I sent out just so everybody can keep an eye out for this. They are the fleet right brakes that are coming up. Um, the ones that we had were coming apart. We had a couple of districts have the same issue. So it is a safety concern, and I just want to make sure everybody knows about it to keep an eye on that. That's the fleet right brake shoes. And like I said, I did give, I did send this to everyone, so everybody should have this. Okay, so our last meeting was held on April 17th. Bob Meyer with Cummins presented on the Heliox chargers and a lot of different chargers too, and the software that's required to use them. And the, the, the particular charger that he went over is a mobile charger, it's a 50 kilowatt went over the different parts of the charger, how to maintain them. It is three phase, 480 volt. Um, the light flash is green. He went over all of the, the different uh, indicators on it. And this meeting was recorded, so you can go to our YouTube channel and get the training there. The little light also works as a stop button. So if you want to stop the charge, you can just hit that button. If the light is red, it's a failure. The light will turn blue while it's charging. Some of the cords, you might end up having to buy a, lo a longer cord depending on where you're, you're going to be keeping your chargers. And the longer cord can be purchased. It's, Fifteen hundred dollars, so it's not cheap. He said that one of the biggest issues that they come across is the cables themselves becoming damaged. So you want to go through and look at your cables, make sure the plugs are good, make sure they're all in good condition, keep the fans clean of debris. He says there's uh, small filters over the fans, and we want to make sure that those are clean. Especially here in the spring, you know, if you get all the dandelions plugging up our filters. One of the neat things is that the, the manufacturer can remote into the charger. So we had a problem with one of our chargers and the manufacturer was able to remote in and tell us what the issue was. It was brand new and it needed a module. They took care of it, but it was just kind of neat how the communication worked. So as we move forward, maybe we'll we'll make that sort of a regular thing where they can remote in and, and give us an update on it. The, the software for monitoring the chargers and the batteries and the buses is a subscription-based software. So it's going to be a membership type thing where you're going to have to pay for that. It's a CMS, which is Charge Management System. The chargers themselves are good for about 10 years or 15,000 charge cycles. That's what they're designed for. And as we get going, we'll have more information and I'm definitely gonna let everybody know how our chargers are working. 
as we move forward. We don't have electric buses yet, but we do have four on order. So today's presenter will be Craig Stabble with, with Valio. He's gonna be presenting on air conditioning and maintenance and repair with the warmer weather coming, or it's here actually. I think it's gonna be a good refresher for everyone. So Craig, the floor is yours. All righty, good morning guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, this is my first uh, online one that I've done for you guys. So um, bear with me, there might be a couple technical difficulties, but uh, we'll get started. I'm gonna go ahead and start presenting now. Can you guys see it? Yes. All righty. Well, my name is Craig. Like uh, I was just introduced, um, I do a lot of the training and uh, field service issues. Um, I'm normally first on the scene if there's a big issue uh, or some kind of recall or, or that nature coming out of the factory. Um, I've been with Valio uh, going on a little bit over three years um, and it's been a great company to work with. Um, here I have uh, a few of our good contacts here is me. If you need to get a hold of me, if you guys ever have any problems in the field, you don't know what to do, um, anything of that nature, get a hold of me, send me an email, tell me what you're working on, and I'm here to help you. Um, here's some also some other contacts here, uh, our manager, our warranty manager. So if you ever have a warranty issue, you need a part sent out, um, get a hold of either Sean or, or Dakota. Um, they can uh, overnight any parts if needed, you know, uh, get you guys back on the road. And uh, of course, Mac, your guys' sales guy. So a little bit about Valio, you know, you've probably seen us um, out here um, on your units. Um, Valio has been a bunch of different companies before. So it was originally ACC Climate Control, and then they got bought out. Um, in 2016, and then it went to Spheros. And then uh, shortly after that, it was acquired by Valio. And, uh, but you'll see Valio all over, all over different manufacturers of parts, uh, everything from seat motors to blower motors to modules. Um, so we built all kinds of stuff, not only school buses, you'll see it going into cars, trucks, vans, um, all kinds of different things. A uh, little bit about us. Uh, we are in Elkhart, Indiana. There was a brand new plant built back in 2016. It's 135,000 square feet um, and currently looking to expand. Um, there is 75 daytime uh, employees, um, but we're also adding two more shifts to kind of compensate for all the load that we're getting. Um, we've taken over manufacturer for some of these uh, OEMs uh, Bluebird, Microbird, let's see some, that'd be a prime example for you guys. Um, so we're here, we're in the market pace and we're taking over, so. So I know you guys are probably pretty familiar with refrigeration, um, worked with it, you know, a little bit in the past, um, but really what we're doing with refrigeration is we're taking the hot air from inside the bus, car whatever you want to call it your house and you're just transferring it it's just moving the heat out of a building basically measured in btus so there's really four major components in a, in a ac system we got our compressor which is hey your engine your condenser um which changes it and your metering device, which is either like your hose. So uh, it's either done by a TXV valve or a orifice. An orifice is like a, a fixed orifice. So, and then you got your evaporator, which you'll see um, your evaporator is what you have. And you'll basically the cold air in your face, the blower motor blows over the top of that evaporator. And uh, that's how you fill that cold air in your face. 
just just so everybody's aware right now most of the stuff we use is uh, orifice tube in the school bus line but we are changing over this year to will be fully txv by the end of the year on all the school bus stuff just a little note so in the past you guys would have a um a txv or i mean an orifice tube which is normally in the evaporator lines on the top of the bus or on the side skirt condenser um and then now here going forward we're going to have a, a metering device uh there's some advantages to this uh meaning that it doesn't have to work the compressor as hard um it it basically compensates as the system needs it so let's kind of jump into this system here so we got our heart of the system the, the compressor this is what what produces the the movement of fluid um so right here we have our clutch that is engaged by either there's a bunch of different ways either a belt or electronically driven um on some of the new electric stuff so from here we will have our our condenser right after here we'll have our high pressure gas coming out of the compressor coming into this condenser after this in this condenser we're, we're going to go through this condenser and right in the middle is called the saturation point and that's where it's going to go um, from that gas to a liquid but it's still going to be hot so if you're touching your lines this is going to be hot to your fill uh, as you're coming around you'll see this condenser as it's coming out it'll be coming out as a full liquid and be coming through your system and that's when you're going to have it come down to your metering device and that metering device will be blowing that that refrigerant over your evaporator and that evaporator is what's going to be giving you that cool sensation blowing in your face and then from that evaporator it's still in a liquid form going back to your dryer or accumulator um, the best way to describe an accumulator is kind of take a look at this picture. Um, you see it, it, it comes in here and it's a full liquid as it comes in here. And as you see in the picture, it, you can see that there's a U shaped in there. So it's it's taking it from a, a liquid on one side and then it's pulling from a gas off the top on the other side. And that'll give you, you know, your whole system going back to your compressor. Because if you had a, a liquid going back to your compressor, you're going to hydro lock it. It's just like driving your car through a, a huge puddle. It's going to do the exact same thing to that compressor. It'll be flooding it. This kind of give you the, the breakdown how I just described it. Do you guys have any questions on the basic operation of an AC system? All righty. As we just said, you know, AC is done um, through a couple different ways of cooling. Um, so here going forward you guys are going to need to get a little bit more acquainted with a txv um, a txv is a metering device um, normally there's two different ways that it can be mounted um, there is a block style and then there's also a style that has a line that's mounted on here's a block style normally you'll see two lines in two lines out a larger and a smaller and that's how it it creates through here, kind of like a carburetor. It throttles up and down to allow a uh, refrigerant to come in and out through here, through your evaporator. That, that'll be the style that, that uh, will be used on the school bus side of it. Here going forward in the next couple of, yes. couple of orders. So going here forward, we got a filter dryer. It is in multiple different forms. Here is one for a rooftops. Um, if you ever shake a filter dryer and it sounds like there's a bunch of BBs in there, you have a problem. There's a desiccant bag in here. 
and it is a part. It is time to replace it. Every time you service your AC system, you replace this dryer. Every time the AC system is open, you replace this dryer. It's a, just a great practice to replace this dryer. This dryer takes all the moisture out of your system. Moisture is the number one killer of your AC system. So going on to our digital controllers. Uh, I have one here. Valio makes a bunch of different styles of digital controllers. You'll probably see this one. I have very, very rarely do we use the digital controllers in the school bus. Are they all rotary? Yeah, well, for now, we're going to be going to toggle switches. Toggle? Yep. Probably better. So. <laughs> so, I don't have any, um, you know, old school switches here, but uh, you guys obviously see them all the time. Um, they've been around for years and years and years. Um, just depending on what your district uses. Um, here going forward, um, we've been using a 80 amp circuit breaker, but we've been having some problems um, right here. You know, if they ever get hot or loose, uh, these terminals are on the back side. They are plastic. So if they ever get loose, they will burn through these housings. I've seen a few... 50 or so probably in the field. Um, so going forward, we have an updated style um, and it's just more of a, a marine style fuse over here, if you can see. Um, we call it the ice cube, the ice cube style because they kind of, the fuses actually look like little bitty ice cubes that go on the post. It's obvious, it's obvious when they burn out. Yeah, it's very obvious makes it easier to diagnose and then here's a couple uh, of our um, boards so the great thing about our boards is um, hey you can come up here check your your fuses if you have a problem um, they snap right into place so you strip your wires they snap right into place right into easy peasy also on our boards we have lights so the lights will be on you'll basically if you kind of take a a gander at this and i will send over a copy of this presentation so you guys can know um but hey if you don't have any lights on here you probably don't have any power so take a look at your circuit breaker first make sure you have power coming out of your circuit breaker and then um, going forward check power at your board um up here at the top of your board is a small uh m6 Please don't over torque this on the back side of it. As you can see, it's just lightly soldered. If you torque this with your impact, it is going to break it. You are going to have issues. The, the typical for that is 18 inch pounds, correct, Craig? Exactly. And uh, we do have a torque wrench um, specified for that if you guys are interested in it. We torque every single one when we install them at, at our installation facilities just to ensure that they are torqued properly. But if those ever back off, you might want to, because if they back off, that's when you have burn ups on that board. So just make sure, that, hey, they are tight, but not over tight. Um, there's a lock washer that's on there. Um, so you guys know. And I'll pull it off so you guys can see. Also on these, if you ever have a relay go out, um, you have to replace the board. It's just how it is. The good feature about our boards is though, the there, we have a fuse before the relay. So if there's any kind of spike or whatever, it typically blows the fuse before it gets to the relay. If the relay is blown, there's a big issue. These have been very reliable for us. We solder the we solder the relays on there just because of the we found that the movement of the bus the the vibration. bouncing yeah the vibration the bouncing of the bus causes those to get loose and then burn up and then nine times out of ten you had to replace the boards anyway so 
with this being soldered down, we have we haven't had an issue with our boards in the last five years since we since we started soldering them in place. All right, guys, we have our uh, wiring schematic here. This will be available for you guys. Also, I will send it in a PDF form so you guys can send it out amongst the shop for all the guys. If they have any questions, they can look at it. Um, let's talk about compressors. Um, on these ones, you guys are, you have what? Dual TM21s, Mac? For the most part, yeah. For the most part, we use dual TM21s. Uh, you can get a system with a single 43 as long as there is a mounting bracket for that bus. Uh, depends on um, if you got a Bluebird or IC, you could typically get a TM43 to run the front and rear system all together. Um, Thomas may be hit or miss. Just depends on if we have a mounting bracket to mount that TM43. The Thomas is a little bit, is this. Uh, underneath of the on the engines a little bit different than the IC and Bluebird so and the 55 and 65 are on rear engine um, buses that I've seen correct yeah we typically use the 55 and 65 on the on the rear engine now it's on the rear engine um, Bluebirds and some of the rear engine Thomases with rooftop large AC systems correct Also on Valio compressors, you might see them all over the place. You'll see them on some of your other AC systems. People buy them from us, Valio. Um, there is a uh, place in Dallas, Texas, where they are manufactured. Um, different from us, but also, you know, the same company. Just a different segment of the company. These TM21 compressors either run on 12 or 24 volts. This is very... You need to look at this. If you have 10 volts going to this clutch and it's burned up, there's your issue. You need to have at least 12 volts going to that. If you have a run of wire over 20 feet, you need to have a relay in it. And, and it's really, we recommend that you have a relay in it all the time. Um, how you tell a difference between a 21 compressor and say a smaller compressor is, hey, it has both two wires to it, both a power and a ground. Um, a smaller compressor is grounded through the housing. These are externally grounded. Um, a great thing about Valio, we use PAG 46 oil. All of our oil has dye built into it. You do not need to add dye to look for leaks in our system. We already have it there for you. Just put on your glasses and look if you have a, if you have a leak. Um, these are about 215 uh, cc's. They're a squash plate design, meaning it's a wobble plate. As that compressor turns, there's a plate in there that wobbles, and that's what gives you your pistons, uh, the sensation of going up and down and creating that pressure in that compressor. So really, what is a, a common reason for a compressor to fail? You know, flooding. Like I said back in the, in one of those videos, you got to think of this is your you know your pump of the system, the heart of the system. Um, if you have a bunch of refrigerant coming back to this compressor that is in a liquid form, it's going to hydro lock that and it's going to explode that compressor. If you've seen a compressor housing that has blown apart, it has most likely been flooded, meaning that it had what. You know, probably a bad air filter, um, meaning that it was allowing extra refrigerant. That compressor is pulling extra hard. So it's pulling that refrigerant that should be pulling in that dryer. It's going to pull liquid straight out of that. So really, the, the key to our systems is maintenance. The more maintenance, the better. Um, you got to realize at the end of a shift, most bus drivers, they do what? They sweep out their bus. That's going to make these filters extremely dirty. And if it's hot out, they're going to have the AC system on. It doesn't matter if you say yes or no. They're going to have the bus running with the AC system on to keep it nice and cool inside. And they're going to probably have the back door wide open. And that, and as soon as they're blowing it out the door, it's sucking up that, that dirt right up into these filters. So be diligent about it. You have your pressures all over the place look at your filters. It's the first thing you need to look at. 
it's it's always good to check those filters at least once a week just to ensure that they're not clogged up uh, especially on some of the um, roads that have a lot of dirt and debris on the side of the roads and everything that might be able to come inside the bus um, that is the number one reason our compressors fail is those filters get clogged up causing too much pressure and it, it kills the compressor um, we also recommend that the that you spray the coils down a little bit uh, at least once every couple months at, in inside on the in the evaporators and the condensers to try to keep those cool try to keep those clean as well i use a green coil cleaner as you guys see in front of me um you could put it in a spray bottle spray it in there and it goes right down the drain great stuff easy to use Here's one example of not cleaning your filters. Here was a two-year-old spool bus that I went and looked at. Uh, and as you can see, they had AC issues. Compressor was flooding. And uh, it was pretty bad. There was little to no air going over those evaporators. Another example of a side skirt. You know, you'll see these on the side of the bus. Um, you know, they're sucking air going down the road um you know you can use some kind of coil cleaner clean them off um it, it's just detrimental to your ac system you have this you got increased pressures um increased pressures is what's going to take out that compressor another thing is loss of lubrication maybe a plugged orifice tube um you know you have a hose coming apart that kind of thing you know there could be multiple different reasons why compressors are failing but normally it's either over lubrication or lack of lubrication <clears throat> here's just an example of a compressor that you know we've taken down as you can see here's a piston on here um and it doesn't have any rings like you guys would see in a normal automotive engine it is nickel sealed so there is a nickel seal on this and that's kind of the uh the friction barrier right there so we've went into loss of lubrication uh flooding starts sludging um another thing is non-combustibles uh you could have nitrogen left in the system somebody could use propane or the wrong refrigerant um in the system to do leak testing so you know, there's lots of different reasons. Um, we always recommend that you use a set of R134 gauges and you only use them on R134. You don't use them on anything else. Um, also, you know, we kind of touched base into, you know, bad grounds, um, the 12 volts. So you need to have a good 12 volts going to that compressor at all times to keep that clutch engaged. If not, as you can imagine, if you just have 11 volts, it's like you just barely pressing down on that clutch pedal. So it's slightly slipping it. You might even see that that clutch is engaged, but it's slipping it. And over time, you're gonna be slipping your clutch and you're, and over time, it's just, there's gonna be no more clutch material to slip. So again, look at that clutch, not enough voltage, smoke that clutch. So here's kind of a breakdown of our of our AC compressor right here. You'll see your pulley, and that's run off, off of a belt uh, from either a mounted on the front of the rear engine, just depending on your application. Um, you'll have your suction and your discharge port. This will be what's coming back to your to your compressor, sucking back, and this is what's discharging. This will be high, this will be low pressure. We use a crimp on style fitting. Um, it basically you slide uh, this crimp over your hose, slide on your fitting, and then there's two crimps in place. Uh, great system, very versatile, and uh, you can uh, build as suited because not every every system is exactly the same. Let's talk about our condensers. 
So a smaller condenser, if you ever have a compressor come apart, a condenser like this, there is no need to flush this. You can spend $300 flushing this thing and you're still going to have black death coming out of it. Why? Because this is a micro channel. You can see all this. This is about the size of the end of a pencil. Multiple different orifices going across here. Just to clean all those out, you're just never going to clean it. These are very, very cheap compared to old condensers in the past. It's way more cost effective just to replace your condenser than to even try to, to um, flush it. When do you flush it? Normally when it's not a micro channel. You'll, you'll look at your condenser and you'll see some big pipes coming out of it about the size, you know, six millimeters or eight millimeters. And that's, that's a tube and fin design. And when you have a tube and fin design, um, they're easily flushable. Um, we do have an inline filter. It's a 50 micron screen. So in here, there'll be a, a screen um, and you can clean it out or replace it. Um, with brake clean. That's what I use every time. Fans, you need to make sure that your fans are working in the right direction and they are all working. Um, we, I'm, so, I'm sorry to skip. So our fans pull nine to 12 amps, uh, continuous 25 to 30 amps in rush when you first start the, the bus um, we use a weather pack terminal easy on easy off if you ever have a fan go out it's a simple four screws and um cut one zip tie and plug in the new one so our evaporators we have our evaporator inside this evaporator you'll have your orifice uh Normally in our systems, you'll see a orange one in here, but they could be a different color depending on your application. Um, the color of these orifice tubes indicates the amount of flow. So if you have a blue one, please replace it with a blue one. If you have an orange one, you replace it with an orange one. Um, orange is a little bit larger than blue, um, which will give you a little bit more refrigerant. Um, we also have our blower fans. Our blower fans is what blows over these evaporators. You'll see a couple different uh, designs of our blower motors, but uh, in general, this is what they look like. So going into these orifice tubes, you know, we have our black one, our orange one, our blue one, you know, these are normally Ford style ones. Um, if you don't have one, normally you can go to your normal auto parts store and they will have these. These are very um, generic in that terms as you can find them all over the place. Typically speaking, if you if you are unsure that you have the right one in it, you can just call us up, give us the VIN number of the bus and we can look it up and, and make sure that you have the right one in it as well. And that is located right here in this evaporator. If you look at this evaporator, you'll see a large line on the bottom and a smaller line on the top. The smaller line where it's spiders is where it's going to give you that. It's going to slide into this into this pipe and they go in one way. Uh, so that'll give you that orientation of these orifice tubes. And this goes inward. So white word, white part inward. as you can see. So what is the accumulator? There's a couple different styles of accumulator, dryers. It's often common accumulator and or dryer. Well, this is what holds the refrigerant before it goes back to the compressor. So basically you wanna be pulling that gas off the top of this and storing your refrigerant in here as a liquid. Um, that is the key. If you have too much in here, that is going to flood this back to your compressor, taking out your compressor.
Also in here, there is a desiccant. We did talk about this once before, but we'll touch base on it. Um, either one on the bottom or two on the sides, depending on the orientation, if it's a large accumulator or a small accumulator. Um, there is a desiccant bag. Um, you know, it attracts moisture. So every time that system is open, you replace that. Every time you do an AC service, a compressor, you replace that. But not only do you do that, that's the last thing that you do in the system. That's the last thing you do to keep all what? The liquid uh, water out of your system. So that's the, the killer of all AC system is that water. Keep that water out and uh, keep the rust and contaminants out. So here's a breakdown. Here's a large one, as you can see. Here's our desk kit bag. Here's the, the U-shaped pipe on the inside, and it's an aluminum housing. Here's another thing you guys need to be looking at. These are called kazoo valves. Um, when you guys are servicing your AC system, make sure that there is a valve on the bottom of that. What that valve does is it keeps uh, bees and that kind of insects going up in, in, in your AC, making a, a nest, clogging up the pipes. Uh, I've seen, you know, water backflow into, uh, into the ducting system and pour all over a bunch of people just because hey the kazoo valve wasn't put in place and a bee went up the up the line so it's a very inexpensive thing but it's a has a great great thing to do you know also you know kind of squeeze that thing make sure that there's no dirt debris crusty stuff in there um and the line flows well you know So another thing to look at is, hey, if you ever have a leak, you need to be looking at your connections first. Hey, visually look over. Do I have liquid running down the side of the bus or down the compressor or down the line? Or is there a line not hooked up? You know, you got to you gotta look for the visual stuff before you get too crazy into the other stuff. Um, we, as, as Valio, use two different styles of leak testing. I personally do a pressure test. I find it way more accurate. I use nitrogen. I bring it up to 300 PSI and I look for a leak uh, using Cal Blue. Um, it's just kind of like soapy water, but it's just way more, uh, it's thicker. It's the best way to describe it. Um, I personally don't use one of these Robin Air uh gas detectors um the only time they ever come in handy is if hey there's something in the rear wall and you don't want to take the panels down maybe you could stick it in there and say oh yeah i do have a leak now i got to take the panel down um we touched base on this before this evaporator cleaner um it works great it cleans the coils everything just goes down the drain um, it'll go right down those drain lines through the kazoo valve and right out the bus. So no need to clean it manually. It does all the work for you. So when we're doing our AC services, we have a leak, anything of that nature, we need to get what? All the water out of the system. Um, water um, will just eat the system alive. It'll eat the lines, your fittings, your evaporators, uh, it's basically like acid inside the system. And over time, it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. It's gonna cause multiple different things. Your orifice tube's gonna freeze up. You're gonna have, uh, your flow is gonna be insufficient. Uh, you're gonna have multiple different things going on um, just by, you know, not getting that water out of the system. Um, we, this is how I personally do it. Um, I use a, um, after I evacuate the system, I have a standalone system, uh, check my refrigerant level. Um, you know, I use a vacuum pump. On, on that vacuum pump, I, uh, I pull it down to at least 500 microns. 
Um, I also do a nitrogen test, meaning anytime I have a system that has been emptied or I replace a component or I have a leak, I do a nitrogen test. Not only do you do a pressure test, make sure it's not leaking, it also does a, a sweep of anything that's inside that system. You have some air you don't want, you have some moisture that you don't want. It's gonna trap that and it's gonna force it out the system. So basically you're gonna bring your system up to 250 to 300 PSI on your high side of your gauges. Please disconnect your low side when you guys are doing this, meaning you don't want that low side needle to peg, which will give you inaccurate readings um, in the future. So just the easiest way is to just keep that out of the system. And you will know that, hey, you have 300 on your high side, you're gonna have 300 on your low side. When you are brazing, another thing you need to have is nitrogen. As you can see, if you ever have a, a braze that you do without nitrogen in the system, it's gonna cause a bunch of contaminants in there. It's gonna stick to the pipe, it's gonna scale, and eventually that scale is gonna come off and go into your system and go where all over. Um, when we're doing our evacuation, we're talking about microns. The, the best micron, you, best thing you can do for your AC service is to get a micron. I use a yellow jacket. Here is a digital one. Um, and basically, if you take a look at my screen, you'll see that, hey, the, the more microns you bring it down to, 500 ideally brings that boiling point of water down. So hey, your AC systems would be working that much better. And it also tells you what? That you don't have a leak. If you have your micron gauge on here and it starts climbing and climbing and climbing, obviously you have a leak. So it's something to look into. Another thing that why I like the yellow jacket is it has a sensor. This sensor, you can pull the O-ring out, put a, a swab in there, clean it out, also, if it ever fails, you can replace just this sensor part. Um, a great system, we've used other ones in the past, and this has by far been the most robust system out there that, that I've used. Again, here's going to our micron gauge. If you guys aren't using a micron gauge, you need to be using a micron gauge. Um, it's the best tool in your cabinet when you're doing AC work. Do it every time you'll know you did a good job. You will have no, little to no comebacks if you use one of these. Here's a pressure temperature chart. If you ever have any issues, um, you can refer to this. Hey, it's 100 degrees out. What should my pressures be? Here you go. You can use that and it'll give you your baseline. Um, can you I, can you click on that and show it to them? Correct. Yeah. I'm sure everybody knows what it is, but it's always good to just see it. So the best thing to know is, hey, what is you add 35 degrees? So basically, this will tell you what is your pressure and what is you're using refrigerant R134. Your pressure is what? 95 so you have 95 and then you you enter that 95 there then you add your 35 degrees that'll give you 130 and that'll kind of just tell you what your baseline should be so going across here it'll tell you hey your high side should be 198 with this system running so just kind of give you a baseline hey do I have enough refrigerant in the system? Kind of helps you with your basics. Another uh, thing that we included in this is our uh, troubleshooting guide. Hey, take a look at this. What's not going on? The compressor's not working. Your switches aren't working. Here's a basic example of, hey, if this is what I need to check, 
here's my my example hey i do i have power on my pressure switches do i have power on both sides of these if not we have a bad pressure switch or lack of pressure Let's talk about improper suction pressure. In a, in a fixed orifice system, it could be, hey, an overcharge uh, condition. It also could be a dirty condenser, like we talked about multiple times. Um, it could also be high return air temperature, meaning, hey, the bus is really, really hot inside and uh, it takes a little bit of time to cool back down. Um, also, for lower suction pressure, we'll see normally an undercharge condition. You'll see like five PSI, seven PSI. You'll know, hey, there's little no refrigerant in there. Um, so here's some other uh, general system uh, symptom guides. Kind of take a look at these if you're experiencing low or high suction pressure, um, things to look at. Notice it's not going to be this every time. Every system is going to have to be diagnosed individually. Another thing that we included for you is a guideline um, of when things need to be inspected, changed, etc. cetera. Um, just the main thing to note on here is, hey, go, just check your air filters quite often. Clean them. Um, check your belts. Make sure the belts are on, you know. Visually walk around, make sure everything's there. Your your lines are ran the right way. Your kazoo valves are, are ran out the side of the bus. So you, everything is just visually acceptable. So that's about the end of my basic refrigeration course here today. Do you guys have any uh, any questions on this? Does anybody have any questions for Craig or Mike? All right, not seeing any. If you guys do come up with any questions, please let me know. I'll make sure that they get answered. I wanna thank you guys, Craig and Mike, for your presentation. A lot of information there. It's always good. This time of year, we always try to have a, a an air conditioning presentation just for a refresher. You know, a lot of these, most of these people have been working with air conditioning their whole lives. But it's good to always have a refresher and always, you know, see the different ways things are being done. So our next presentation will be held on June 12th and it's gonna be our DOT round table. Now we've got quite a few questions already. Um, there's still time. I need to submit these questions to Jeff Corey and but as you get more questions, please keep them coming. We went over the fleet rate break issue earlier. And if anybody has that issue, please let me know. We want to we want to keep all of our members informed on this stuff. The summer seminar is well on its way. July 11th in Syracuse at the On Center. The, uh, I know I believe Valio is going to be there. There's yeah. uh, there's yet yeah, there's an awful lot of new vendors this year as well, and we're coming into the new the new school year here coming up the end of one starting of the next, and we're looking for the training topics that you guys want for this coming up year. I'm just going to be setting up a steering committee meeting so that we can iron out our training session for this coming up year. So does anybody else have anything to add to today's meeting? I'll okay. send over a copy of this to you guys. I'll send it to you and you can, Daniel, and you can kind of distribute it as your team throughout. Yes. And yeah, that if you have any questions, I'll also sit, put my phone number at the bottom. Call me, text me, email me if you have any questions or concerns. I'm here to help you. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much.
and this meeting was recorded and we will post it to our YouTube channel so you guys can get the information there as well for anybody who didn't wasn't able to make the meeting. So that being said, I will let everyone go back to our work. I know things are really busy all around and we'll see you guys next month. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll see you later. Thanks, man. Thank you.